Awesome. We'll go right ahead. We'll uh, hey, it's that's the beauty of being live. We're here with uh, Saint Cloud Bourbon Ray Walker, and I'm just about to pour some. Um, you, can you hear me? All right. You can hear me. Okay, Perfect. great. Hey, Ray, we've been talking for a while. It's great to finally have a whiskey with you here virtually. And you're based in California, right? That's right. Excellent. Hey, it's great to have you. Uh, I'm in uh, Walnut Creek. Walnut Creek. And, you know, I, I of course, I'm in Kentucky right now. Uh, I uh, get to uh, California quite often to host a lot of whiskey tastings. And I had been seeing your brand all around, and it really just kind of came on Bourbon Blanc's radar uh, recently. Uh, so St. Cloud Bourbon, an incredible bottle, a really unique flavor. Tell us about the brand and really what led you to uh, to create St. Cloud Bourbon. Yeah, so um, basically the the brand is a very small, uh, small company. And um, yeah, I mean, we, we started out in 2016 and uh, the, the idea is to just be as small as we can, focusing on as high of quality as we can with no uh, kind of, um, I guess, no compromises, I think would be the, the easiest way to, um, to convey what we're trying to do. And so we do some contract um, work where we are uh, working with distilleries to work in a manner that's going to give us the, the kind of mash bill uh, that we want. Um, and then we do all the aging ourselves and I make the, the decisions, um, you know, myself after that, or we can just um, basically purchase source uh, separately. And so, yeah, we, we started in 2016 and everything together. Um, I think I lost you for a little bit, Tom. <laughs> I'm right. No, I'm right here. I just want to put the camera on you so we could so we could hear you. No, go ahead. Keep keep going. Okay. I was like, do I keep going? Yeah. Yeah. yeah All right. So going. um, I was like, ah, oh, what do I say? All right. So, <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, so basically, we started in 2016, and the the idea was, you know, keep things simple, make things uh, easy for people to understand the brand, uh, but then not not box ourselves in with exactly what we're going to do because we want to give ourselves the options to source different whiskeys, to right. do contract distilling and just, you know, not have too much of a defined uh, limit for what St. Cloud can be because we want to give ourselves um, as much um, horizon as we can to be able to explore, recreate, um, just play around with things. And so that's, that's pretty much how it came uh, came to be. I was I was a winemaker in France, and coming out to uh, back to America, I wanted to do something that involved my roots and my father's family. Going back over 200 years, is from uh, Kentucky, Marion, Kentucky. Yeah. So, um, so I mean, I wanted to do something that my family was attached to. You know, they were they were farmers out there, um, but you know, I. As you know, a lot of the farmers, you know, distilled their own, um, right. you know, whiskeys and all that. But I, but I just wanted to do something that that touched home uh, for me, and that was that was kind of the the start of it. Absolutely. And so you were making a uh, what kind of wine were you making in France, and whereabouts were you? That's that's very exciting. Right. So I was making uh, Grand Cru uh, and Premier Cru Burgundy. So I was mainly uh, Cote de Nuit. So I did some Chambertin, I did Mazoya Chambertin, Cham Chambertin, uh, did some, um, well, uh, Chambord Musigny, did some Premier Cru from there, did some Bonnet Premier Cru. And um, yeah, I mean, things things were going very well until I, I ended up picking up um, the wrong employee and the wrong uh, investor. And, you know, I, I had gone quite a few years with, just being the only employee and and all that for for my company and things had gone well and you know just things blew up you know not in the best way after after wow. those things yeah so then uh you you were in france for a while making the wine you came back to the u.s and what what what, what really led you to bourbon have you you have the that's and so family history in kentucky have you always been a yeah. bourbon fan or 
Yeah, I mean, I, I I don't know about always. I guess since I was probably 26, right. something like that, you know? So right before I started making wine in France, at the same time I really got interested in wine, I got interested in, in Kentucky bourbon as well. Um, funny story is that one of my buddies that was involved with wine, he introduced me, um, you know, big thank you to my buddy, Sean Reed. Um, the first bourbon that I had was a 20 year old Pappy Van Winkle. And the reason I was um, interested in that bottle was because it, it just looked kind of old, a little bit ornate. And so I'd ask my buddy like, Hey, what's that bottle? And he was like, Oh, I'll get you a pour. And I just, I think that that's a very easy, uh, gateway kind of a bourbon, you know, because it's oh, yeah. easy to like, it's very round. It's, yeah. it's very generous. So yeah. as a wine, as a wine lover, um, I think Pappy 15 and Pappy 20 are, you know, something that you can easily enjoy. So that's what really got me excited. And I just, I just felt like, okay, well, while I was making wine in France, I had the idea that I would play around with some whiskey. Um, my father's, um, my father's family before being in Kentucky, they were in Virginia before Virginia, they were in Ireland. And so, while I was in France, I was thinking, hey, if I can do a French wine, which I'm not connected to France in any way, but I can do an Irish whiskey, I can do a Kentucky bourbon, that would be like, you know, a cool thing to do to get my hands into and, and feel like I'm doing something you know, a little bit special, but mainly fun. Right. And so when I came, when I came back to the US and I figured, okay, well, now's my chance. I'm starting over, you know, I'm going to probably make some wine in California. But you know, let me also do something fun. And that was St. Cloud. That's, that is a, a fun way to get started in the, in the bourbon business and quite a bourbon that um, really got you excited and passionate about bourbon. I mean, those, those pappies with that age are, are really something spectacular between the, the older one and the 15. Did you, do you have a favorite between those of all the pappies or? It turned out that I loved uh, 15, you know, at that time when I was buying it, it was like, I think about, 60 or 70 dollars a bottle for the uh yeah. for the the 12 and the 15 right. and um you know I, I had some of the older guys at the time you know telling me oh you're spending too much you're spending 115 for the 23 and you know what is i'm spending like almost almost 100 for the uh for the 20 year and they're just like you know that used to be 60 bucks for the for the 20 yeah. year right. you know and so right. i was just like i know you know i'm overpaying but right. I, I love it. So when, whenever people came over to um, to my winery, you know, and we really got to drink in some of my wine, I'd say, hey, do you guys like whiskey? And inevitably people would say, yeah. And so I'd be like, hey, you, you want to try some pappies? And they'd be like, yeah, I would love to. And it just, I just had loads of it. And so I was like, yeah, sure. Let's, you know, let's drink. So right. I, what I really loved about, um, you know, when, when people were drinking my wine, because they would read about me in like New York Times, or maybe they read um, my book, or saw me on TV, or something like that. The a, a big drawback to how the wine crowd would approach that is there. It was met with a lot of, um, you know, people trying to be very careful when they met you. You know, right. people would wear like their their, you know, you know, fancy shirt or something like that, and not really, not really act like themselves. Maybe put on airs a bit. Right. But as soon as we started drinking whiskey together, then I started really learning about, you know, who I was with and they started to, you know, I think understand me some more as well. And so I, I like that, that communal uh, aspect of, of uh, bourbon, of whiskey in general, you know? What, why do you think, I mean, and I, and I see what you're saying. I mean, of course I, I, of course I do enjoy wine. I enjoy a little bit of everything, but why do you, um, why do you think that is? Why do you think whiskey, brings out um sort of the uh the down-to-earthness and people and and has that unity unlike really any other spirit or any other beverage i don't know you know it's it's funny when it when it came to wine um i always said that you know that was kind of like the the great equalizer you right. know because you can have people at the same table with you that you don't agree with and you know still kind of find some uh some commonality right. um but I find that there's a lot of analysis and I think that that analysis can kind of get in the way of people just enjoying each other. You know, I've, I've, 
I've hung out with people that are like masters of wine and other stuff like that. And they, they come to hang out with you and they talk about the wine and they're just like, you're confused at the end of it. It's like, did you actually enjoy the wine? You know, whereas, um, and I, I would also, when I told people I was making wine in France, people would say, oh my God, you know, I, hey, I'm not an expert, but you know, here's the wine I like, you know, it's, you, you know, it's not fancy right. like what you do, but it's like, they're already apologizing for what they like. Whereas when I tell people that I produce bourbon, they're just like, yeah, my husband's an expert or right. I can tell you anything you want to know about it. And, you know, all this stuff, you know, we'll show you some really good ones. And it's like people seem to trust their own palates a lot more, their own experiences. Um, I, I can't exactly put my finger on what it yeah. is, but I, I love that feeling of people um, taking control and taking ownership of, of what they enjoy themselves. You know, so I mean? important. Yeah. No, I agree with you, and I've and I've seen this this before with when people say whiskey really, and I've always believed you know whiskey really unites. There's something about having bourbon. I mean, even before I um, started Bourbon Blog and uh, almost 15 years ago, did a documentary about it, and I was going to the, the original Bourbon Fest. There used to only like be one Bourbon Festival in Bardstown. Going mm -hmm. to that, seeing how it brought people together, and realizing this is something we need to keep on following and doing stories on it. But there is something that's just inherently kind of there in the spirit, especially uh, with our heritage. I think as Americans, and uh, I don't know if it's just kind of ingrained in our DNA or whatever it might be. Yeah. But I agree, it, it's something that um, brings us together. And more than just in America, it's whiskey. You have whiskey with people from around the world. It feels like there's something. Um, I often wonder if it's because it's a little higher proof and gets us to the truth a little faster. But right. I think there's more to it than just that. Right. There is. Yeah. Hopefully, hope there's more to it than that. Okay. Yeah. Right. But uh, man, that's uh, so the uh, the winery uh, the wine you were making. Is there still any of that out there? Is that some that people might have in their collection? They might be familiar with. Or I mean, some people. I mean, frankly, you know, um, you know, I've I've actually spoken about this on on different podcasts and right. you know different things like that that have way less viewership um which is fine which is fine um but um you know it's one of those things where i try not to get too too involved with explaining my my wine background sure, because sure, sure. you know i put i put everything i i owned and and everything that i believed about myself and my um really how i projected the best version of myself being right. in life, I put that into the, into the wine. You know, I I did everything by hand. I decided to not use um, you know electricity, so the wines would have basically the the softest transition from being grapes to turning into wine. And I really laid it on out on the line. And at the at the time, you know, being completely transparent, like, hey, we're buying grapes here. And hey, here's a picture of me making the wine. Here's a video of me, you know, making the wine. And hey, I'm right. stomping the grapes. I'm getting into the tanks. And I, I just adored um, that that lifestyle and what that brought to my life wow. as a Californian that that transplanted everything that he knew to right. a foreign place, you know. And um, to to have that kind of attacked when when things went, you know. Um, you know, went pear shaped, you know, essentially, um, it's, it's really hard because, um, I think a lot of people, they aspire for great things and maybe they don't, maybe they don't put the effort into it. You know, frankly speaking, maybe they, you know, it's easy to just love wine or love bourbon and not try to make it. I have the sickness that every time I enjoy something, I want to try to get as close as to production as I can to right. be as close to this thing that I'm passionate about as I can. And usually that leads to production. And usually that use leads to me starting a business and, and all that. I put my, I put my heart and my soul in everything down to the textures that's on the, the, the paper label that goes on there, the weight of the cap that goes on the bourbon. I mean, just, on and on and on, you know, I'm, I'm all over this because I love it. And so to, to do something that's very difficult and to be a trailblazer, to do something that nobody really has done before and 
constantly try to, you know, to up the ante, to try to do better, to to not rest on your laurels. I mean, you are are climbing altitude while you're on a tightrope. Right. And so, you know, some people appreciate that and they say, well, shit, I'm just along for the ride. Some other people will just say, this guy's probably gonna fall or I want him to fall. And if he falls, maybe, maybe, maybe I need to be the one that's nudging him. You know what I mean? Right. And and that's not to to take responsibility, you know, take responsibility off my shoulders. But I think that when when you are the kind of person that's driven to go to those heights, you don't mind falling. You don't mind failing at all because it's within you to try to strive for the best thing that you can do. You know, otherwise you're gonna be wasting your life, wasting your talents. And that's that's a bigger problem than failure in in my book. So to to kind of have this beautiful thing that I was very proud about and, you know, things that I invested myself and invested my family's life into, um, to have that not go the way that I wanted and then to have people kind of in the peanut gallery, you know, just say, you know, slanderous things about you. It's, you know, it's it's a very sore thing, you know, on, on one hand, but on the other, you're you're kind of feeling like, Hey, I laid it on the line and I can look myself in the mirror. Right. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, cause I, I can't tell you how many times I had, you know, I'd read online. People are just like, I bet you, he doesn't even have wine from this vineyard or that vineyard or whatever. And, um, you know, I'm a sensitive guy. At least I, I used to really, really be a sensitive guy. And I would go under my house into the cave and uh, look at all the barrels of all these famous vineyard, you know, names that I've read about in books that were like two, 300 years old. Wow. And, you know, you just feel like I'm a part of this history and I'm writing myself into that history book. I'm not going to give any kind of credibility to people that are trying to tell me something that, you know, isn't true about myself, you know, and sometimes that's all that you have, right. you know, because, you know, in a lot of these situations, the the very core of who you are as a person, only you can really know that. And so you have to, you know, you have to hold on to that in the in the good times and the in the and the difficult times. So after after losing everything that I owned, and you know, I had lost like my children and you know, um, all the money that I had in the bank. You know, I, I didn't have you know, much there, but then I had my wine, all my, all my, um, assets were my wine. So to, to have that go sideways because of the people that I surrounded myself, uh, myself with and who I trusted myself with, um, I knew that I was the person that needed to, to uplift myself, to uplift my life and my family's life. And so, yeah, starting from negative dollars, in my bank account when I came back to America, I drove Uber and I uh, ate loads of humble pie till I was fat, you know, just busted my ass. And while I, while I did that, I was building St. Cloud thinking, hopefully people can support this vision that I have. And thankfully people did. It's a, it's a really incredible story and the passion that you you already had and the knowledge and the skill that you had uh, in in beverage and also in life, you have brought to something that really hasn't been done uh, quite this way. It's a bourbon that really uh, stands apart from from all others. Um, what 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 is this? What 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 is your vision? What was what was your vision for St. Cloud? How did it come up alive and and what are we tasting? What's uh I Appreciate you sharing all this. This is this is really powerful. Yeah, no problem. Um, and I appreciate you saying that. Um, Absolutely. So the so the vision was, I wanted to come in as um, as a winemaker, somebody that you know, if I see different products, you know, in a grocery store, different foods, I'm I'm always interested to try new things. And I know that everybody has the, I think everybody has a great palate. I don't. I don't think like uh, I have a special palate because I used to make French wine. I think that I have my palate 
that is attached to my specific uh, sets of experiences. And so I figured that even if I was sourcing, which I would love to be able to produce in the future, right. but even, even just um, sourcing, having my perspective matched with my preferences, it seemed to me that I'd be able to have something that would be unique and something that would be clearly unique. Um, because I think a lot of the times people have um, interesting palettes, but it it can kind of uh, ebb and flow. It, it, you know, it can kind of dip and dive. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. Mine, with my palette, it's very precise what I'm trying to do. And so um, that's that was the idea with St. Cloud. So being decisive in, in what I was choosing from, but then also giving myself all this room to, to be able to explore, to not have to be um, bound to any types of rules, because a lot of the, a lot of the old guys, they are, you right. know, and, it, and those things that they're bound by are, are very powerful when it comes to brand loyalty and uh, to people supporting them. And it's a, it's a very valuable thing. But for me, I don't have that. I'm not a uh, heritage distillery. I'm not coming from a uh, distillery, distillery background. And so for me, it was more important for, um, for me to come in there and just explore what was possible with the branding, explore what was possible with the kind of bourbon that we were putting in the bottle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for example, being 100, 119 proof, being under four years old, being unfiltered, it's not a common thing. Right. Um, right. So, <laughs> right. And so I, I always, I always tell people when I was making wine in, uh, in France, I think I was the only one that was doing Grand Cru's. All of my Grand Cru's were used oak. And wow. even people that would prefer used oak on some of their Grand Cru's, if they had Chambaton, for example, which is one of the most expensive, you know, vineyards you can get fruit from, uh, they would inevitably put a whole bunch of new oak with that. And so the idea was to, um, the, the idea was that Chambertin has a certain personality to it that requires uh, new oak, which I thought was a load of bullshit. I think that um, oak is, is a great platform to be able to support what's already there. You know, as it's rising, it can be supportive. And there's a certain level that it reaches an equilibrium, right? We're talking about balance. But then at a certain point, you talk about the, the oak being overwhelming. It spun this, um, this distillate out of control. It spun this wine out of control to where all of a sudden it's over oaked. And so I think that in bourbon and whiskeys in general, uh, because a lot of the history that was there, especially like in the 70s where people had all this extra spirit that was aging, um, there's there's this culture of thinking everything is better with more age and that's not the truth and right. complexity doesn't only happen with time in barrel it also is already inherently there with the distillate so it seemed to me that there was a, a niche that i'd be able to go into focusing on balance focusing on not over oaking focusing on allowing there to not be a house style. You know, that was the thing about um, about my my business in France. I didn't want somebody to be like, hey, you can tell, you know, that he made this wine. I wanted the, the actual underlying fruit or the material to show itself right. instead of myself leaving too much of a, um, of a signature, right? So I think that that's where, that's where the, uh, the value is. Uh, in providing experiences and allowing consumers to not be led by the nose for what they should be able to experience and what they expect from your brand. There should be all the room in the world that people have to be able to explore themselves and find something interesting. You'd like to have, for what you have out there, a, a variety of styles. You want that, that to express itself. And that way it feels like, because there are some brands I can think of that you know, and for them that works to actually have that house style or on a bourbon or, or a wine that works, but you'd like to showcase a variety of different things and what you put out there. 
Yeah, I don't want to. I don't yeah. want to paint myself in the corner because right. the lifeblood of Saint Cloud is my enthusiasm and my right. passion. So if I paint myself in the corner because um, commercially this was successful, but now I have to do that, otherwise um, that will seem like I'm going off brand. So you see that even with the marketing because I'm. Oh yeah. I'm the marketing. You know, I I did a lot of the design work. You know, I'm the the CEO, but I'm also the janitor. I'm also the dishwasher, and I I'm I'm very proud to to be able to do all those things. But you don't, you know, you don't want to only play classical music in your ads or play right. hip hop or something like that. So I'm playing like '80s synth music. I'm playing, you know, R and B, whatever it's going to be, whatever I feel, you know. And if I want to do some bottles that are black, if I want to do some bottles that are um, hyper shifting colors where there's going to be five, six, seven different colors. Fine. If it's going to be pearl, if I'm going to do a high rye or I'm going to do, you know, something that's just like 70% corn or whatever it's going to be. If I want to extend age, this one, if I only want to have a release with 50 bottles, I'll get to do that. Whatever, I'm, whatever I want to do, I want to be able to explore and do whatever I want. That's exciting to me all the while hoping that and assuming that there's probably going to be other people that want to support that that experience as well. Oh, absolutely. And it's uh, it is such a unique brand and the bottles are beautiful. You have, you have the bottle there in front of you to. Uh, uh, yeah, let's see. Those, this is, this is a, that's a mock up of our of our 12 year. I love it. That's that's it's very lovely. What is the St. Cloud? Who is who is St. Cloud? What is the, what was this um, this name? This, uh, this saint who who is St. Cloud? Right. So St. Cloud is not a person, you know, necessarily or or a character. Um, really, I wanted to have this idea that, um, you know, for the name to have a solid aspect to it, uh, there's a certain firmness to the name Saint. You know, there's and also oh, there's no. a little bit of history or tradition that that one feels from that. But I also wanted to have another word that kind of played with that, that put itself at odds with it, which was cloud. And so with that, it's an airy, kind of a elegant, fluid word. And it feels good to say, it looks good. And I think that it those two words going in opposition, it showed a, a big part of what the dichotomy is inside of our brand, because there is this minimalist packaging that we have. There are traditional values that I have that are very firm, concrete, but what's on top of that are all these ideas, all these different um, ways that I want to be able to explore what St. Cloud is going to be. And I, I knew from the start, I wanted those things to be there that they can be working in tandem. So, you know, in short, it's a fictionalized name, but it's based on you know, you being able to hear the hear the name Saint Cloud and see the bottle and see that the two meet along with our branding. Yes, yeah. Even the first time I I saw it in a bar um, in Kentucky, I was like, this. There's this feel that I get from the bottle from the Saint that feels um, that has a real magical feel to it that feels um, right. sort of otherworldly, um, and the taste as well. I mean, so so um, you've had several. You've had how many expressions total that have been out? Of this so two far. that have been released and okay. right now we're bottling uh the single barrels so you bottle single barrel. We, yeah we have an and, and everything we produce is um is barrel strength and unfiltered right. and the the reason is that number one that's my preference right uh but part right. two of that you know it, it as as people that are enthusiasts people that are looking for experiences we can be kind of bummed out when you enjoy something and you you want to look further into you know a little bit more upstream to find out where did this come from or what have you in i mean not to pick on anybody but weller 12 right i love antique 107 oh yeah and and when you have weller 12 you know many of us thought like man it would be great to be able to have this cast strength you know and you know not be filtered and, and all these other things and so for me i didn't want somebody to enjoy something that we put out at 90 proof or 100 proof or right you know 
one of the things I wanted to do was like 109, like cloud, kind of like cloud nine. So I was going to do like a cloud 109, right? That's good. But, I was, but the worst thing to do was to, to send that to somebody. And then they say like, oh man, I wish I would have had this like cast strength, you know? And so you're just like, ah, shit. So we can always like add water, right? We can always take it to that proof. <laughs> right. That's the thing. You can't unsalt your food. Right. You can't. Right. You you can't unproof down, you know, I guess you can do reverse osmosis or what have you, but you know what I mean? But the thing is like, I want people to have as clean of an experience as um, unfiltered, undoctored. And if you want to put it in, I've seen people online, you know, do mixed drinks with our stuff. I mean, whatever, you know, I have to let that go. Right. Um, but the thing is, I want people to, be able to have the ability to have the option to have this just as it was out of barrel. And if someone wants to put an ice cube or a couple of drops of water or whatever they want to do to it, I don't want that person's preference um, to dictate what somebody else can have as an experience, you know? Absolutely. What, what I'm tasting right here, what am I, what am I tasting? What is, what's going into this and you know, why is, what makes it different? That's Kentucky bourbon. No, um, <laughs> so so that's just shy of that's just shy of four years. It's Kentucky okay. straight bourbon, unfiltered. Um, there is a good amount of rye in there. Okay. Um, very very high um, yep. amount of rye. Of as, price. Yep. Right. Right. And so um, the the barley is a very high quality. I think. I think that I think barley having people that care about their barley I think is mm. a big deal because it's kind of like it's kind of like people that care about their salt you know um, I hate to keep bringing it back to salt but there I think there's a lot of uh, takeaways I think a lot of people because rye people love rye and you know people you know are just like for bourbon you have to have a high percentage of corn in it and people pay attention to those things sometimes right. um, I feel like the the barley the type of barley and how the barley is actually treated. Um, I think that escapes a lot of people, but yeah, good, I think good that, point. yeah, but I think that complexity in barley is, you know, pretty expensive. Um, but I think that that's where that complexity, that youthful complexity comes from as well as having high rye, uh, because young corn is nothing special. Um, so to be able to have a high rye in a young bourbon, have it high proof and have it unfiltered, it's kind of like, how is it not going to taste good? How is it not going to taste complex? It's the best of a lot of worlds. Right. I mean, it's so for me, when people are just like, oh, I'm surprised um, that I like a bourbon this young. It's like, well, you shouldn't you shouldn't be because you have a couple of people that are tasting it. You know, for, for first and foremost, myself, I decided that, you know, this is something that works with what we're trying to do. But part two of that, there's a lot of young, complex bourbons out there that never get the chance to be released to consumers because it gets blended into something else um, or basically they're they're filtering it or they're proofing it down. So by the time it gets to someone, all that special uh, complexity, that special texture that was there, the all the nuances that were there, the oiliness, all that is just gone. And people think, oh, it's nothing special because it's young. And it's like, no, you had every opportunity for that to be a good young bourbon. Oh, absolutely. And uh, a few questions coming in here. Uh, so this is, um, this is it. What proof is the proof again on this one you said? 119. 119. And uh, just shy of four years, hi, Rye. Uh, what happens in the barreling? What what really brings out these um, these notes in a in a unique way? I mean, I think for me, a lot of a lot of. I think if you if you like this bourbon, that means you and I probably like the same kind of young bourbons. I think yeah. that's that's really what that comes down to. Right. Um, there's nothing special um, that's in these barrels. I'm not like a wizard and I can only craft, you know, taste young bourbon. But I think what makes it special is it's kind of, you know, the brakes taken off these young bourbons, you know, no filter, you know, taken out of time that, 
you know, where the, the, the barrel is actually expressing itself well, right? Because it, it is always changing, right? Depending on the season, you know, when you, when you barrel something down, um, I mean, sorry, when you bottle something, uh, you can have a bad day, a bad week, a bad month to, to actually put something in bottle. And I'm tasting the hell out of these bourbons. So I think if people like it, they like my palate. We agree. We're <laughs> simpatico. You know, it's like we are similar. We're taste buddies, whatever the hell you want right. to call it, you know, <laughs> but I'm not doing anything special. This is very right. classic, traditional bourbon that's mm -hmm. just not messed around with. You know, of course right. we'd like it. Well, it has this beautiful, I mean, there's there's so many, there's a lot of beautiful uh, texture, I feel like, from uh, the barrel that comes across here. And that's why I was asking that this is uh, just shy of four years with the recipe you stated, uh, but there's no extra finish in any other tasks or anything like that. No. So nothing. just, I mean, this is beautiful, young bourbon that to me, it while it has the youthfulness, there, there are levels of this that taste uh, much older. Uh, then, right. then just that four year mark to me, it goes into, um, and it's, I'm sure it's all the magic you've, you've put on it that just has a, a little bit older of a flavor. Uh, the complexity, a lot of spice, maybe even some cloves, some creaminess. It kind of has this nice balance to me of like candied and spicy both, but in a really yeah. elegant fashion. And the finish is just very clean. And, um, it has, there's a lot going on here. This is extremely yeah. well done. Very nice. I'm glad thing. you like it. Yeah. If you if you were to taste it blind, what would you guess? Like knowing that, of course, bourbons can taste different ages, but what would what would you guess? If I was going to guess the age, um, good question. It's it's so tough now that I know to actually convince myself right. that I don't know. But probably probably when I did first have it, because I think I tried it. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it was at a, a bar that we um, go to. In over in Henderson, Kentucky, and I think it was on my birthday. I was like, I want to try this. I haven't tried this. this is like last year. I think I was guessing at least like seven plus. I mean, at, at least seven. I was thinking, what yeah. could this be? Could it kind of be a seven plus nine? I mean, it would definitely be way up, well above six or seven. I mean, I was like, this is really interesting. And I was trying to figure out what am I getting here that's different. It's I know it's a bourbon, yeah. but there's this other layer of it that I kept thinking. Is there some sort of beautiful finish that this has? Not that there's any like wine notes, I mean, you know, or any yeah. like port or any of these kind of things, but there's this extra layer of like uh, kind of elegant barrel that is on this that's not on a lot of bourbons that I know of that are like this age. So it's extremely well yeah. done. Thank you. Yeah. I think, I mean, it's, I think a lot of the things that I do are based on hypotheticals or ideas just that I have in concept. Um, but I mean, you think about some of the, the oiliness that comes naturally mm. with these bourbons. Um, and I mean, it's there to coat your mouth. It's oh, yeah. there to, to have a roundness to it. Right. And I think a lot of us, you know, we go into tasting older bourbons and we're just like, okay, that's where that's at, you know? Right. But the thing is, I mean, you can have that on, on younger bourbons, but so many of those have stripped away that oil to where something that's a hundred proof tastes a whole hell of a lot less smooth than our 120 proof. And that's because of that natural oil that would naturally be there. And I think the bourbons that I'm picking out, the, the palette that I'm, you know, um, trying to support and go after, it's based on that being a big part of what I'm tasting for, because there's, there's a whole lot that can be there as far as texture, aroma, and uh, palate impact and the finish. A lot of people speak about finish like, oh, it's got the Kentucky burn. It's like, that doesn't mean shit to me. I mean, right. it's it's all about flavors and extension of flavors, how broad, how long, you know, the impact, you know, is it trailing off? Is it, you know, all those things are, are different. And I'm looking at that from my wine making background and as a wine drinker, but there's, there's so much more there than just being like, does it have a burn? It's like, you know what I mean? Right. And the, and I would say the, the for this, the, there is a, a definite warmth. Um, I think it drinks lower than 119. 
it, you know, I can tell it's higher proof, but it's nowhere near what I would think 119 would usually look like. Um, yeah. And I, I think all those elements really balance each other. Uh, so many great people watching, uh, Adam and Frank and, and uh, Robert Haynes Peterson, uh, just so many great people. Karen, thank you all for watching. Uh, Robert's asking, um, is the current expression available nationally or is this something, the one we're trying or the other two, can we still find these or would we be able to? So batch one um, was interesting. We we bottled um, on like the 30th of, of March okay. and we sold out in about two and a half months. Batch wow. two sold out before we even uh, bottled, wow. which is pretty crazy. Um, that was just so this, these, past, this past year or about a year ago then. That was, so batch two was in, um, what, January of this oh, year. Oh, wow. Okay. And so, so we did it. So like I'm self-funded and I, like I said, I don't have any employees or anything like that. And so I could have got a lot more 12 year barrels. I only, I only picked up three and that oh. works out probably to like 75 cases. And wow. I have a couple of my distributors that are in say Tennessee, Georgia, that are trying to get either one third up to everything that we produce at the 12 year. Um, and I mean, we can't, we can't support going national at this point, even though we're, we're about to pick up a distributor that wants to take us national, but that would mean like probably literally like five barrels in one state. I mean, five, uh, five cases in one state, 10 cases in another state, right. you know, so, I don't know if it's better to, you know, have uh, have more cases in in a small amount of states or to spread it out. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're doing things to try to, you know, lift up volume so more people have the opportunity, you know, to get it in some of these sure. other states. Sure. You know, and and we have a website where people can go on and people can, you know, try to purchase when we have stock. But we sell out so quickly that, you know, I don't. I don't even try to promote it, you know. Sure, sure. No, that's uh, that's exciting. It's exciting to try something at, and to talk about something so unique and rare. And uh, of course, we always hope that as people enjoy these bourbons and whiskeys, that 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 more can uh, be experienced uh, in in the future. That's uh, that's great to see a brand um, built that way. So two two batches have gone out, batch one and batch two, um, and those were same flavor profile approximately or no i well we use uh we use the white white oak from france on mm -hmm. batch one okay and so that that left kind of a, a citrus kind of a, a dried orange you know bit of a bit of a profile on that right. and it was all about power flavor impact uh, that was 120.3 i think was a proof on that and batch two wasn't and so batch two was way more in the in the classical vein of mm -hmm. what you what you'd expect and appreciate for for a kentucky bourbon okay um, but moving forward for the single barrel releases it's going to continue to be uh barrel proof unfiltered but we're doing single barrels um mm -hmm. it occurred to me a bit late that with my thoughts towards uh having unique experiences i didn't want to blend together these barrels, I wanted to be able to separate them to to further highlight the different nuances that would be there based upon the barrel, you know. Right. right. So so we have coming up a twelve year and an under four year single barrel. Both of those, I think the twelve year is around one thirty one plus proof, mm -hmm. and the other one is one twenty one nineteen to one twenty one, something like that. Gotcha. So the the twelve year. Um, and then the and then the single barrel will be yep. the next releases. And, and then about, we, we have the hyper shift too. And the what? The hyper shift. So we have hyper shift. Uh, so basically, the color change bottles. Um, the that was thanks to COVID. Thanks to COVID, I was bored, and um, I'm I'm a gearhead. I love cars. Um, I'm American. And, um, and so basically I had this idea about painting the bottle, uh, color shift. Mm -hmm. And so this, this paint that we, that we came up with has about five to seven colors, depending on how you look at it. And so I just did it for shits and giggles just, just for myself, but it came out so well, I posted it online 
And we had people saying, hey, you know, I'll, I'll pay whatever you ask for it. And I mean, we we legitimately have probably about 300 requests for that wow. in the last two weeks. Um, so I created this thing called the works division, which is since I'm a car guy again, it's kind of like our AMG division to do all the crazy things that we want, all the stuff that's, you know, beyond, you know, what we normally do for St. Cloud. Um, this is the, you know, red bottle, matte black, um, color shift bottles, mm -hmm. gold bottles, different things like that, that, that basically are too much of a pain in the ass to produce on a large scale. But we want to be able to show all the different expressions that, you know, are part of the vision for St. Cloud. So, right. you know, those are coming out soon, too. That's exciting. Yeah, I saw the um, the the and they look the hyper shift is like the, they look like purple in the pictures. Right. There's kind of that purple look to them. It's like purple, green, blue, copper. Yeah, it's There's a beautiful a, looking. Yeah. But those actually the color looks different from the light and that's on it. Is that the idea with the paint? the direction that you're looking at it the direction of the light that's on it and the amount of light that's on it it's going to always look a little different. different wow beautiful looking yeah. bottle so again the 12 year the single barrel the hyper shift um sounds like a very limited production about how many of each of these will be will be out there well so each of the single barrels are going to have hyper shift versions Okay. And for example, the the twelve year uh, that we produce, the regular uh, bottling is going to have about probably four hundred fifty to five hundred bottles that we'll right. produce. Uh, the regular uh, white label single barrel that'll be probably twenty seven hundred bottles. Mm -hmm. But the hyper shift uh, twelve year, there'll probably be twenty five of those, and there'll wow. probably be about fifty of the of the white label single barrel. White label so, single. Okay. So really, yeah, so, uh, very limited uh, production, especially of the the twelves. Only we're only looking at about five hundred, and um, for the single barrels, the uh, well, the other ones that are a little, that are under right around the four year mark are going to be maybe a few thousand bottles. About twenty seven hundred, twenty eight hundred, something yeah. like that. Really, very very limited. Um, someone's already asking a question about what what are these what are these retail for approximately? So for the for the regular single barrel, we're at between 125 and 135. Mm -hmm. uh, the batches, those went out at around 115, but retailers have sold up to $200 a bottle on those. Right. Um, so what we what we try to do on the 12 year, because we don't have many of them, we price those out at 229. I don't know what the hyper shifts are going to be, because there's such a pain in the ass the the entire <laughs> the entire ass it's not like <laughs> one part of your it's it's a real big pain but you know it's like one, one of those things when something turns out so cool and you love it so you're you're forced to do it but damn it is very difficult to do and just and just the time that you've been able to spend uh working on some projects um since covid that's actually led to this hyper shift that's uh that's incredible. Um, such a such, such a cool idea. I mean, really, just to kind of have the art carry throughout. Will these have the uh, the French oak? Either of these, like the was it version one had the French oak, right? None of it. I mean, I the thing is, I I confused so many people um, with that because people are like, oh, he doesn't even know what he's doing because bourbon has to be American oak. Is like it doesn't though. So. Um, I had so many people that were confused about that. Right. I, I had answers so many emails about that. <laughs> and, you know, it's just irritating. So, right. you know, maybe down the line under the under the works line, we'll mm -hmm. do something like that. Maybe we'll do some Hungarian white oak. We'll that do some Japanese white oak. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, having it as our main um, our main release, probably not just because, you know, I'm, I'm trying to keep things painfully simple. Right. You know, I want I want interesting bourbon that is not confusing for our main line. Right. You know, and then then for the works division, we can do crazy shit, you know, but that's how. Yeah. Well, the, the flavor is is so complex that I mean, you've really you've really done something so special. And I'm sure that um, 
uh, that you'll continue to with with all of these releases. Uh, again, for those of you just joining us, a lot of people joining us on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube. It's Ray Walker, founder of St. Cloud a Bourbon here on our Bourbon Belong live show. We do this every night at 8 p.m. We've been doing, I think this is 60 some episodes. I haven't even counted the episodes, Ray. We've uh, we started right when COVID started interviewing someone new and interesting uh, that I had been hoping to chat with, uh, just like yourself, uh, bourbonblog.com live. Make sure you bookmark that 8 p.m. Eastern every night. And also place to go just to make sure you all can um, bookmark as well as your website, stcloudbourbon.com. And I guess if there, because people have asked about where they can actually find this, is it in different markets? Is that the place they would be able to do a product locator there on St. Cloud Bourbon? Um, if you go on there, you can sign up for the mailing list. Uh, mm -hmm. We're going to have some fun things that are that are released through there. Okay. Um, it's it's difficult for us to be in you know more than just the states that we're in, which are Kentucky, Tennessee, Arkansas, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Georgia, and then okay. the U.S. Caribbean islands. So it's tough to be able to reach people in Texas and New York and California, right. which is where I'm from. Um, so the website's really good for that. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's really the best way to go. Okay. And again, just so everybody knows, say those states once again so we have them. <laughs> All right. Tennessee. Tennessee. Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Tennessee, Kentucky. Uh, we have Georgia. Oh, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. uh, Rhode Island. Massachusetts. And I think Arkansas. I'm not sure Arkansas. that, but then we have U.S. Virgin Islands right. uh, as well. But yeah, if you're watching this as well, um, yeah, please follow us on Instagram. I think we have maybe 14 followers. It might it might be like 3,000, but you know we we could use some more. We could use some more support yeah. on there and the, you know, love at, it. At Saint Cloud stuff. Bourbon, is that word? Yeah, out at Saint Cloud Bourbon. Um, because you put some beautiful. Do you, you take those pictures as well? No, I have. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have like two or three talents. That is not yep. one of them. So, yeah. Yeah, follow him on 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 Instagram. Um, a lot of great, a lot of great photos. It's just such a beautiful bottle. It's it's really like no bottle I've really seen in the, in the bourbon and, and spirits world. It's just a very special bottle. And uh, that Saint Cloud, I like I like that it can stand for so many things. And that and that oh, yeah, so that top is really it's a strong top, isn't it? Oh yeah, it's very heavy. I mean, all yeah. the pieces on here are real metal. Yeah. Real heavy. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we put a lot of, a lot of quality, a lot of detail right. in, in all of this. Um, yeah. Everything's heavy. The thing is um, I, I tell people so I, was, I was born in 1981 and I think, I think being from the eighties um, we're used to seeing a lot of things that are supposed to look old, supposed to look ex expensive, right. but then you touch it. You know, like when I first went to Europe, I was touching the walls like an idiot. You know, I was like, is this really? Stone? Right, is this really you that know? old? <laughs> right. You know, I'm like knocking on it so bad. Um, but, you know, I wanted to get something that that looked and felt. And, you know, you have all these different textures, even our, our paper. I mean, I can't tell you how many hundreds of paper, you know, paper samples that I touched to get that right texture or even like our medallion. I knew people were going to be touching on this medallion. So I had to touch different finishes right. just to see what that was going to feel like in different weights, you know, for the caps. I mean, it's, but, but you have to do those things when you love it. And then when somebody in Australia or something picks up a bottle and they're just like, dude, like, have you felt this paper? I'm like, yes, yes, I have, you know? So I, I love all that stuff. I, I geek out over every little detail you know you put a lot of attention and thought into all these who who does your your caps by the way who does who does those who produces them yeah yeah we have some people in uh in argentina that do oh. that wow. um they're really in nice. fact the whole thing is yeah and I, thank you i i try to do as much as i can inside of the u.s but but frankly it's you know just being so small you know economy of scale is not on our side sure. So we end up going to the best people we can in the world. And because of that, we get our bottles from France, uh, from Northern France. We have the paper coming in from Southern France. We have Argentina doing all the, the metal pieces. And then we get everything printed in St. Helena. And then everything's shipped over to Kentucky. 
and then put on by hand. Every single bottle is done by hand. So it's uh, a lot of work, you know, but we don't, we don't compromise. I can tell well, on, from, from beginning to end, you've, you've done something incredible. Uh, a question, what can we expect for the flavor profile for your upcoming single barrel? And I guess the 12 too, you know, for both of those, what can we expect to, uh, to taste on those? Yeah, I'd say um, for the for the regular single barrel, um, it's I think everything coming from St. Cloud, we focus on aromatics. Um, we want deep aromatics and that may or may not come, you know, connect with the actual palate of it. But we love that deep warmth that um, that you, you know, expect from a Kentucky bourbon. Uh, there's a lot of caramel and butterscotch on the under four years single barrels. Okay. And the, the palate on those is very round, a bit of what you're tasting on yeah. that one as well. Yeah. Um, very long finishes, I'd say, especially for the age. Um, yeah, I mean, there's just a lot of a lot of youthful complexity to that. As far as the 12 year, um, you get a bit more depth. It is round as well, but you just have so much more depth um, to it, not a crazy amount of spice to it. Um, even on the single barrel for the for the for the younger single barrel, the the spice that you get there would be clove or something like that. But it would be very light, very passing, very balanced. And it's something that really doesn't get in the way of the youthful character um, of the bourbon. But same is true on the uh, on the older. So I don't know. It's 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 just damn good. In fact, I think our 12 years is probably one of the best bourbons I've ever had, frankly. Wow. And I'm, I will not say that to anybody else. I try not to compliment my own stuff. Uh, but since we are sourcing and, hey, all I did was make decisions after the fact, I can I can say this is outstanding bourbon and one of the best I've ever tasted. Well, it'll be exciting to taste the, the 12-year-old bourbon of the St. The Cloud. It's a couple of uh, great releases to look forward to and to the uh, hi hyper shift color is, is it what's called Hi the hyper yeah the hyper the hyper shifts are all the ones that are changing colors um, but everything coming out of works is essentially bottles that are 50 bottle production or less so right well much like uh, you know I, I often say what makes a good bourbon a cocktail or spirit is something every time I come back to it there are new flavors, unique flavors that I get, just not that one expected flavor. Um, you know, I think that that will be very complimentary, having paint that shows something new every time you look at it. So I think it's very fitting um, for your brand because this is definitely something, every time I come back to it, I'm getting just a little something different and I'm like, oh, okay, I'm really seeing something else here. And it's it's hard to say that about uh, younger products, um, but you've, you've definitely thought through this, right? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah this is, I appreciate it. I know you I know you know your bourbon and uh, you've drank a whole lot more than me. I think there's I'm not saying you're I'm not calling you a lush. You know, no, no, I, I, yeah, yeah. but <laughs> you might be. I don't, I don't know. Maybe I am. <laughs> you know, but the th I think I drink less. But the thing is that I just want there to be a unique experience. Yeah. And I I don't want people to say, all right, well, St. Cloud, this is what you can expect from them. Yes. You know, unless you're just saying elegance, refinement, you know, even our, our packaging and the way that we market, I wanted to make sure that we we're inclusive um, to everybody, you know, people yeah. that are outside of the normal demographics. So oh, yeah. we're not trying to pander to women or pander to people that are above or below the, the segments that are normally um, marketed to. But we want to be inclusive, you know, include those demographics because it's it's important. Whiskey should be drank by women, by men, by heterosexual, homosexual, everybody, whoever, right. whoever wants whiskey, whoever right. wants good whiskey should be able to drink that without it being attached to being a macho man and being all this other stuff like it's America's drink. You know, it's it's our drink to be able to create and share those experiences, you know? No, oh, very true. It's something that should uh, should bring us all together and something that uh, we can we can all enjoy. And, and for those of you watching, if you're bourbon fans, if, if you can find this and hopefully you can, 
at some point, whether it's getting a whole bottle or finding a great uh, whiskey bourbon bar like I did. The place I had it first was called Hometown Roots in Henderson. I was thrilled they had it and uh, hope, hope people can find it and take a taste. Will we potentially ever see um, a rye from you? Anything else in the future that you're going to look towards? Any any plant, Anything you can tease forward? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely want a rye. Um, again, I think rye um, has has a big ability to show complexity, especially at a young age. And I want I want those unique experiences. And I think rye is just incredibly complex and incredibly oh, yeah. nuanced. So I, we definitely have to do it. Um, but frankly, I have a hard time, you know, trying to figure out the best places to get Kentucky rye. If I oh, went yeah. elsewhere, there's a couple <laughs> people that make outstanding rye outside right. of Kentucky, right. but um, I'm trying to, you know, stick to Kentucky uh, because it matters a whole lot to me, even though I'm just a poor Californian. Um, I love Kentucky and um, I, I want to honor that history. That's wonderful. Well, what a, what a history that you have and, and a history that you're making in the bourbon world to have something unique, special. Uh, for now, it's something rare. And I think that makes it uh, all the more interesting, but hopefully as you grow your company, uh, you can you can get it in more hands. I mean, that's always the thing with whiskey, right, is, is growth and the demand. And that's been the fun part we've been following for a while to see how it's all uh, continues to grow. Uh, so, Ray, this is great. It's just great having a drink with you and, and learning more about what you do. And um, it'll be exciting to hopefully after... Uh, after the end of all that we're going through in the world, see in, in California, because I get out there quite a bit for a, hmm. for a bourbon. Would love to have a bourbon with you there and uh, enjoy that. That's great. Just one bourbon? Can we have a couple We more? can have several, yeah. We can crack okay, open. Good. <laughs> okay, good. We'll find one of your single barrels and just crack it up. What we get, I always say I like to have bourbon under palm trees, which is always a good way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. No, I, I, would, I would love that as well. And I, I'm just honored, you know, that you – you know, that you had the interest in, you know, just had me on here and it's really cool. You know, I, I try to tell people, man, I was, I was driving Uber, you know, up until the day that I bottled um, wow. our first batch, you know, and I, I had to build this from Uber money. So to, to have the support from folks um, and to have folks, you know, like anything that we're doing, I mean, I'm, I'm honored, you know, cause there's so many people doing outstanding stuff. So to let a little guy like me in there is, you know, it means a whole lot. That's great. No, it's, it's my pleasure. And it's great. To, it, your story is amazing. And congratulations on what you've built. I think it's really inspiring and reminds us that, um, you know, if someone has a dream as you know, it, whether it's the beverage world, whatever it may be, just keep going for it. And it's exciting to see how people start in, in the line of uh, beverages and bourbons and how, just how much, you know, growth there has been. I think it's really exciting. So congratulations to you, Ray. Thank you so much. Yes, you're welcome. And thank and thanks to all who, who watch it. We had a lot of people watching tonight and some who still are. And just uh, thank you all for watching. And, and we're going to, you know, wherever you're watching, it's going to continue to be up permanently on those places. And again, we do this every, uh, every night, 8 p.m. Eastern. So just keep coming back and watching. And, uh, Check out, I will put this up once again here, stcloudbourbon.com, and also look for them on Instagram. They're on St. Cloud Bourbon. Cheers, buddy. Thanks so much, Ray, and uh, thank you. great stuff. This is very tasty. Thank you. Appreciate it. Cheers, my friends. Thanks. Thanks. That, was, that was fun, man. That was really – thank you for this.